How we doing? Testing out this talk to text thingy. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But right now it's working, that's pretty sweet. How's your Friday treating you? Are you prepared for the weekend? You guys want to see a really cool rock? If you get the movie reference, well, I guess there's there's two different movie references, two possible ones. Get it? Now you might see Let It Go and be like, oh, we're talking about Frozen here. But look, there's knives, there's bullets. This is a reference to Rambo First Blood, part one, starring Sylvester Stallone. My mom made that. She loves rock painting. get started here. Let's turn down this music a little bit. Great movie, right? Oh man. I I, I really enjoyed all the Rambo movies. But Rambo First Blood Part One definitely the best. At least in my humble opinion. Did you see the most recent Rambo film? Where he goes back to Arizona and some drug lords try to find him. It doesn't, a spoiler, it doesn't turn out well for anybody that comes after Rambo. It's just not going to work. 
It's just not going to work at all. All right, everybody. Today we're talking about reference flight conditions. This is what we're going to linearize our, um, our equations about. So reference flight conditions or RFCs provide nominal flight trajectories about which we linearize our nonlinear, I mean, I, I guess that kind of goes without saying if we're linearizing, our nonlinear state space model for aircraft. This model has 12 states and four control inputs. So let's get into some of the building blocks of common reference flight conditions. So uh, these reference flight conditions are basically composed of combinations of simplifying assumptions. Let's go through a couple basic ones at first. These first two are going to apply to every reference flight condition we use in this class. So the first one is a homogeneous atmosphere. What does that mean? This just means that the properties of the atmosphere do not change with position. And so uh, we've been using the inertial coordinates x, y, and z to describe the position of the aircraft. So a homogeneous atmosphere assumes that the properties of the atmosphere doesn't matter what your X, Y, Z coordinates are. They're not going to change. So, for example, this assumption ignores how density changes with altitude. All right, so um, we're assuming that if you are a thousand feet above the ground that's the same as if you're a hundred thousand feet above the ground in terms of atmospheric properties all right so this is this is something we're going to use all the time an isotropic atmosphere this is the next one it's similar to homogeneous but it's a little different it assumes the properties of the atmosphere do not change with direction Meaning, it doesn't matter the attitude of my aircraft in the sky, no matter which way it's turned or pointed, the atmospheric properties aren't going to change depending on direction. So most often, this just implies no wind. That's the most basic one. Uh, it, it doesn't matter if we're we're assuming we don't have any headwind. The relative wind that the aircraft is generating in this class is just a function of it flying through the sky. So it's moving relative to dead air, and that kind of creates relative wind. But we're not assuming that there's just wind blowing on its own. And uh, this is mostly going to apply to the heading angle of the aircraft, psi. So um, if you remember from our Euler angles, psi is kind of laterally 
which direction the aircraft is pointing. So for the three to one Euler angles, that's our first rotation. It's just a, a rotation about the Z axis. Okay, so we assume that the aircraft dynamics aren't changed by our initial heading angle because it's not going to affect the aerodynamic forces if there's no relative wind. Okay, so these are two common assumptions we're going to apply. Homogeneous atmosphere, isotropic atmosphere. That's what they mean. Now let's get into more specific ones. Often we're going to specify a velocity and attitude. I mean, an altitude. So in other words, the magnitude of the velocity, which we call capital V, we're going to set it equal to just a constant. And you're going to see this star superscript a lot today. And that just means setting that variable to some nominal value. And it doesn't have to be a constant value, although often it will be. Okay. So that's velocity, and altitude is h. So I might set that to some nominal value. OK, so I have a homogeneous atmosphere. I have an isotropic atmosphere. And then I might say, for my reference flight condition, I'm just flying at a given velocity at a given altitude. And that's what it's like most of the time for a commercial flight, right? OK. Let's get into some more specific reference flight conditions, though, because it'll get more complicated than this. So here are some basic ones. The first one we're going to look at is steady flight. And this assumes a couple things. All right. So number one, if you, this assumes that the inertial velocity of the CG of the aircraft with respect to the inertial origin. So if I take the time derivative of that with respect to the body frame, body frame, sorry. Oh, and I don't like that I use square brackets here. Okay. So steady flight assumes that that derivative is zero. And we know that the components of this inertial velocity, how would I copy this? With respect to the body frame, so you've seen this a bunch, let's just do it though. If I express that in body frame coordinates, it's UVW. So if I'm assuming that the time derivative with respect to the B frame is zero for that vector, it means U dot is zero, V dot is zero, W dot is zero. So U is a constant, V is a constant, W is a constant. Okay, this is this is a tr this is a question for those of you who are brave enough to 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 try to answer this in the chat. Does this mean that the acceleration is zero? And I'm talking the acceleration of the aircraft relative to you know a fixed frame, so the inertial acceleration. If I assume that u dot v dot w dot is zero, does that mean the inertial acceleration is zero? Or in other words, does it mean that the inertial velocity is constant? Dilly, you say no. Do I agree with you? Anybody else have an opinion? Do, do you have an explanation why? I mean, it's tricky, right? Because 
I'm saying that, okay, U is constant, V is constant, W is constant. But does that mean that the inertial acceleration is zero? It doesn't. Just a hunch, but with an explanation, it might be. Yeah, I know. Um, because, let's see. Let's just do this real quick, because I, I think uh, this is a very tricky thing, okay? So, the inertial acceleration is the time derivative with respect to the fixed frame of my inertial velocity. So you take your velocity, take the time derivative with respect to the fixed frame. Now, here's where the transport theorem comes in because I could write this time derivative as the time derivative with respect to the body frame. And then here's the, the extra piece. You gotta have the angular velocity of the body frame with respect to the fixed frame crossed with that velocity vector itself. So what we're saying here is this steady assumption, it's assuming that this term is equal to zero. For steady flight. But just because I set this term equal to zero, that doesn't mean that the inertial velocity, I mean, that the inertial acceleration is zero. So this term is the inertial acceleration. So setting u dot v dot w dot equal to zero only implies that the inertial acceleration is zero if the angular velocity is also zero because you have to consider this term as well it, it's really tricky to think about okay so so steady flight, number one, it assumes that that term is zero, meaning u dot v dot w dot is zero. So that just means u, v, and w are constant. Steady flight also assumes that the time derivative with respect to the B frame, so this is also with respect to the body frame, of the angular velocity of the B frame with respect to the fixed frame, is zero. So this would mean, because once again, the angular velocity in B frame components. So if I project that vector onto the B frame, we call that P, Q, and R in the B frame, right? So if that's zero, that means P dot equals zero, Q dot equals zero, R dot equals zero. And so this implies that P is constant, Q is constant, and R is constant. So when you see steady flight, usually we just, in our minds, we go right 
over to this. That's what it tells us. UVW, PQR, those are just constant numbers. So that's steady flight. Okay, this next one, non-turning or straight flight. What do you think this one means? If the aircraft isn't turning, what can I what can I specify here mathematically? <laughs> Dilly, you still there? Do you have the answer for me? You're one for one. No brave souls today. <laughs> what was the question? What is non turning or straight flight mean mathematically? Like for steady flight, I made these assumptions, but it, you couldn't really know that in advance unless I just told you that it meant that. But in this case, this title is very descriptive. So I'm wondering what mathematical condition on the aircraft can I specify given that it's not turning? What does it mean to be turning? Aha! Well, UB MAE student is correct. Dilly, you're actually you're you're right, but you're not specific enough. Let me tell you what. <laughs> Whoa, look at all those emotes just flying through. Okay, so if you're not turning, it means that your angular velocity is zero. Or the zero vector as UB MAE student appropriately said. So that means that P is zero, Q is zero, and R is zero, which, which also, if, if it's gonna always be zero, that implies that P dot, Q dot, and R dot are zero. But just because these terms are equal to zero doesn't mean that they're like one doesn't imply the other. That's that's why Dilly is incorrect. I'm sorry. Okay, so non-turning flight means this. P is zero, Q is zero, R is zero. The angular velocity is zero. This also implies something about our Euler angles. If we're not turning, then our attitude in the sky has to be constant. The orientation is unchanging. So our Euler angles are constant because those describe your orientation in the sky. Okay, we got a couple more. So that's non-turning flight. So when we build a reference flight condition, we're gonna combine together a bunch of these things. All right, level flight. This assumes that the altitude is constant. So in other words, h dot equals zero. And your altitude is equal to minus z. So we could also say that z dot equals zero. To clarify, does steady flight mean that the inertial acceleration goes to zero? No. Good question, Dilly. It doesn't. However, if you combine steady flight with non-turning flight, it does mean the inertial acceleration goes to zero. Sense of velocity? No, 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 no. For steady flight, the, velo the angular velocity wasn't zero. The time derivative of the angular velocity was zero. So for steady flight, you have the time derivative is equal to zero but the angular velocity itself, so P, Q, and R could be constant. 
But I'm glad you brought that up, because if I have steady flight and I also have non-turning flight, then if I look at the inertial acceleration, I get both of these conditions. Kaboom, kaboom. Both of those are zero, so the inertial acceleration is zero. All right. Wings level flight. This assumes that the wings are level with respect to a flat earth. That is, the roll angle is zero. We're going to have that roll angle be zero. So that's what we mean with wings level flight. And then we have, I think this is the last one we're going to do. And then we're going to start analyzing these, combining them. So coordinated flight. This is assuming that there's no side slip. Side slip, that's our beta angle. And, and all this means is that there's no component of relative wind in the lateral direction, meaning I'm not getting any wind from the side. The nose of my aircraft, well, I'm just front facing the relative wind. There's no wind coming from the side. No wind coming from side. So it's kind of like a totally planar model for the aircraft. All right, so like I said, reference flight conditions are constructed from combinations of the criteria above. You can build uh, various conditions from lots of combinations of these things. And by the way, this is not an exhaustive list. I'm just giving you some ideas of what are out there. So other criteria can be used. Now, we use these criteria to define the equilibrium conditions for our state space variables for our aircraft model. So like I said, our, our big state space model, it has 12 states, it has four control inputs, and when we're controlling the aircraft, we're using this model. But we're gonna linearize this model about equilibrium points or like nominal flight conditions. Um, so the criteria, they give us explicit constraints on some variables, but they don't constrain everything else totally obviously. So you'll see what I mean, but we have to solve for the equilibrium conditions for the remaining variables. So let's explain this a little bit more. So we have a state space model for an aircraft and it looks like this. The derivative of my state vector is a nonlinear vector function of my states and my inputs. So that's the most compact way of writing a nonlinear state space model. Now for aircraft, the state vector is given by, well, you could write it one of two ways. And we explain what these things are, but it's like, uh, it has like inertial position, it has attitude. So these first six states describe the pose of the aircraft. And then this is the inertial velocity projected onto the B-frame. Here's the angular velocity projected onto the B-frame. So this describes everything about the aircraft dynamically as it stands in, in the sky at any point. And when you're doing analysis, you could pick one or the other. So like instead of Z, we can pick altitude and we just know that H is minus Z and u, v, and w. So v is the magnitude of the velocity. Alpha is the angle of attack. Beta is the side slip. So we got 12 states. Our input vector 
I'm going to keep the order the same. Thrust, the elevator angle, the aileron angle, the rudder angle. So if I want to linearize my nonlinear state space model, I need equilibrium conditions for all of these variables. So that's 16 equilibrium conditions total. So if I want to linearize, I have to specify equilibrium conditions for all of the variables. And so we saw up above how these reference flight conditions specify some of the variables. Um, now we're going to indicate equilibrium values for a given variable using a star superscript. So for example, if I have delta sub E star superscript, this is the equilibrium elevator deflection. Now the interesting thing about these reference flight conditions is just because I specify an equilibrium position, these won't always be constants. So there could be reference flight conditions where these variables change with time and we'll get into those. Okay, so let, let's get into an, an example to show how some of this works. All right, so I'm going to describe a reference flight condition made up of a bunch of stuff. I'm going to say we're doing steady, wings level, non-turning, coordinated, descending flight. All right, so let's try to visualize this. What does that actually look like? Steady means that U, V, W, P, Q, R equal zero. Sometimes that's a little harder to imagine. Um, okay, non-turning, that's easy to see. That means the angular velocity is zero. Wings level, my wings are just flat with respect to the earth. Coordinated means there's no side slip. So the wind is coming totally from the front, not from the side and descending flight. So I'm decreasing altitude with time. So basically this might look like a plane just coming in straight for a landing. So that's, that's how I would think of this. A plane's coming in straight for a landing. That's our reference flight condition. The descension rate, let's say H dot is fixed at this value. So constant altitude decreasing over time. And <clears throat> let's specify <coughs> the inertial velocity magnitude as this constant. <coughs> Excuse me. So just to remind you, this would be equal to u star squared, v star squared, w star squared. So the inertial velocity components projected onto the body frame, if you take the magnitude for this, they have to come out to a constant. All right, so we're, we're also going to do our like most basic assumptions, homogeneous atmosphere, isotropic atmosphere. So that just means it basically doesn't matter which direction I'm landing this plane, whether it's pointed to the north, to the south, uh, and it doesn't matter my initial height. All right, we're going to break down these criteria to just practice. All right, steady. This means that my equilibrium U dot condition is zero. Or if you don't like using U, V, and W, 
we know that we can substitute those states with capital V, alpha, and beta. Those are like the alternative states for, the, for that velocity. So you could use U, V, W, or capital V, alpha, beta, but steady in either case, it's going to mean that those are zero. And we're also going to have zero. Okay. Wings level. Our nominal roll angle, zero. Hey, you be math prof. I am having a nice day. Welcome, welcome. Haven't seen you in a little while. There we go. I hope your Friday is going well. Okay, non turning. This means the angular velocity vector is zero. So that means our components of the angular velocity projected onto the B-frame basis vectors, those are all gonna be zero. P is gonna be zero, Q, those are zero. And remember, this implies that our attitude is also a constant. If I'm not turning, then my orientation of the plane in the sky is fixed. This is constant. This is constant. These are just the Euler angles. Roll, pitch, yaw angles, constant. All right, the next <coughs> condition is that this is a coordinated maneuver, meaning that the side slip angle is zero. And finally, we're descending at a constant rate. So the change in height and altitude is just equal to this constant setting. And it's some constant that's less than zero. Because we're descending. Which is also the name of a really great song by Tool. Off their newest album. Okay. So we went through all the different flight conditions and so based on these conditions, we know a couple things. Uh, this roll angle, zero. Um, so we're just kind of checking the status of everything here. Like how many variables have we actually specified? So this, this one is specified, it's just a constant. These ones are angular velocity values. These are all zero. Okay, the side slip, because this is coordinated, this is also zero. Um, okay, X and Y, I'm gonna call these free variables, meaning it, it doesn't matter what I set these to because we assumed a homogeneous atmosphere. That doesn't really matter. And, and while we're on that note, this heading angle is also free because we don't have any uh, wind and uh, so we have the isotropic atmosphere so basically to satisfy this flight condition we could set X and Y 
They could be anything. Uh, this could be anything. The height. This is. I don't want to say it this way. It's not fixed, but it's governed by that constant dissension rate. So whatever my initial height is, it's going to change at a constant rate with time specified by that constant. So we basically have everything here except, oh no. this pitch angle and this angle of attack. So these variables, these are not so clear cut. Just based on the conditions given me at face value, I have no idea what the angle of attack or the pitch angle is. Pitch angle. So that's one of our Euler angles and then angle of attack. You'll also notice, so that's, that's our state vector. So there's basically two outstanding states that I don't know what to do with. Um, this statement also applies to our input variables. If you notice from a reference flight condition, it's not like explicitly saying the thrust setting needs to be this or the elevator deflection needs to be this. Okay, so we have to investigate, investigate these conditions further. Can you explain why X and Y and Psi are free? Sure, sure, sure. Okay, so, so what I'm saying is, when, when I say a free variable, I mean, uh, or wait, let's start it this way. So like I said, the, the conditions for this maneuver amount to this. It's a plain flying straight at a constant velocity, but it's kind of descending constantly with time. When I say X and Y are free variables, what are X and Y? Those are the like inertial lateral positions. So uh, it could be X and Y coordinates for Phoenix, Arizona, or X and Y coordinates for Buffalo, New York. When I say free variables, I'm meaning that if I assume the atmosphere is homogeneous, like it's the same everywhere in space, then it doesn't matter if I'm doing this maneuver in Phoenix or Buffalo. You see what I mean? Like I could specify these initial conditions given the Buffalo XY or the Phoenix XY, it's not going to affect this. Same thing with the heading, Psi. Because um, if I'm assuming that there's no wind on this particular day, it doesn't matter which way my landing strip is oriented, like if I'm coming in from the west or from the north or whatever, if there's no wind, it would look the same. And so that's why I'm also calling that a free variable. So when I actually simulate the dynamics of this flight, I'll have to pick something, but it doesn't really matter what I pick, the flight's going to look uh, the same in terms of the reference condition. I'll still be satisfying the reference conditions. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Um, so to figure out all these other variables that aren't like explicitly specified, hey, you're welcome, Dilly. Um, the way that we're going to figure out what these are we have to investigate these further using our kinematics and dynamics equations.
And this is where it gets more fun and interesting, all right? Because basically we've just been saying, ah, okay, this means this, this means this. Now it's going to get a little more dicey, as they say. Okay, so we're going to use kinematics and dynamics. Let's start with kinematics. So we're using kinematics and the conditions to determine some of these variables that I marked in green. So, okay. So we have translational and rotational kinematics, right? So here are the translational kinematics. This is how X, Y, and Z change with time given my inertial velocity projected onto the B-frame. Let's look at the bottom row of this. So I'm going to multiply out this bottom row. Um, and, and we're going to do this at the reference flight condition. And all that means is I'm going to substitute in these superscript values. All right. So I'm going to multiply out this bottom row here. All right. So this is going to be minus u star times sine of my pitch angle star plus V sine cosine. So I'm just multiplying out that last row. Plus W and remember Z is equal to minus H dot star. And for this problem, we are assuming that it's defined for us what this rate of dissension is. So I, I know this term. That's, a, that's some constant. Okay. Now, this equation gets a little simpler because from our wings level flight, what do we know? I know that my roll angle is zero. So basically, in this equation, I'm going to have this sine of zero. That's going to go to zero. So this whole term is going to go away. And then I have cosine of that roll angle of zero. So th this term is going to go to one. So this gives us this. So if I take care of that negative sign, I'm going to have u sine blah, blah, blah. And then this one has to be a minus now. I missed a star here. Okay, so this, this equation is giving us some information about my pitch angle because this shows a relationship between the pitch angle, which I don't know, and this variable, which I do know. Um, now, do I know U star and W star? Well, not really because if you remember, the reference flight condition specifies capital V star, which is related to U star, V star, and W star. <coughs> Excuse me. But, um, so V star, this is something that comes from the wind frame. Remember, we defined the wind, we defined the wind frame so that its longitudinal axis is pointed right in, in the direction of the velocity. So, if we express this equation using some wind frame variables, so the wind frame variables, that's V, alpha, beta, that all came from the wind frame. So let's, let's rewrite this equation in terms of the wind frame. So here's how we do this. So I, I got to take these U and W variables and rewrite them in terms of wind frame variables. And we have this relationship. This is U, this is V. Oh, but we have to, when we do this, re, uh, 
remember, uh, this is a one of our flight conditions was that this is coordinated. A coordinated maneuver, and that just means that the side slip is zero. So that means anywhere I see a beta, that's that's also zero. So that means u star is going to be simplified to v cosine of the angle of attack. v star is going to be zero because I'm going to have that sine of beta where beta is zero. And this cosine of beta is going to go to one. So this is just going to be v star sine alpha star. <coughs> Okay, so now what I can do is I can take this equation that I had up here and I'm going to substitute in for u star and w star these new expressions that are in terms of wind frame variables. So let's do that. All right, so I'm going to have u which is v cosine alpha times sine of theta, which is my pitch angle. And then I'm going to have minus w, which is v sine of alpha times the cosine of my pitch angle. And if we simplify this a little bit, both of them have v in common. Minus cosine sine okay fortunately there's a little trig identity for this so this is actually equal to v star sine of theta minus alpha okay so I, I made a little note over here this gives us a relationship between theta star alpha star which we don't know what they are, and uh, but it gives us a relationship between them and the specified h dot and v dot, which we do know. Okay, so I'm gonna put I'm gonna put a box around this. All right, so we we haven't figured out everything yet, but we got a relationship from the kinematics that gives us something. Now we're going to move on to the dynamics. So we looked at translational kinematics. Let's look at translational dynamics. So dynamics incorporates our forces, which you, you see over here. We got like weight, thrust, our aerodynamic forces, etc. All right, let's let's rearrange this a little bit though. So all that I did in the rearranging is I moved that term over to the left-hand side. So now you see we're subtracting it. <coughs> so my question for you, chat, looking back on our reference flight conditions, what simplifications can we make to this equation that you see? No takers, eh? Left hand side is zero. Yes, it is. There we go. I knew you'd come through. Okay, this term is zero because of um, the steady flight condition. So that, that's just the definition of steady flight. And then this term is zero 
for a different reason. Non-turning flight. Because if the angular velocity is zero, then, you know, R is going to be zero, Q, P, R, Q. Yeah, so that's going to go to zero. And if you combine both of these together, it means the inertial acceleration is zero. So the combination of steady flight with non-turning flight creates what we might call unaccelerated flight. <coughs> okay. So applying our reference flight conditions, all we're gonna be left with is, is this over here. And because this right hand side or this left hand side is gonna be zero, we could also multiply both sides by m, and the m is gonna disappear. So I'm gonna have zero, zero, zero. And here I, I put stars on everything because it's only going to be zero if all of these variables are at the equilibrium condition that satisfies this reference flight condition. It's, it's not going to just be satisfied in general. Um, okay, so I, I listed this rotation matrix up above, but there's no way we're going to fit that all in one frame. But I'm going to, so we're going to write out if we multiply this whole thing out, this is what you get. You have minus of the weight, sine of your pitch angle, plus your thrust, plus the aerodynamic force in the longitudinal direction. So that's the top equation, it's equal to zero. For the next one, if you multiply it out, you have weight times the sine of your roll angle, cosine of theta plus y, your aerodynamic force in the side direction, that's equal to zero. And the last row, the weight, cosine of the roll angle, cosine of theta plus z is zero. But you might already see this. We have wings level flight. So our roll angle is going to be zero. So we can make that substitution. Wherever we see a roll angle, it becomes zero. So it doesn't change this top equation because the roll angle doesn't show up. Here, if we substitute a zero roll angle, that whole term goes to zero. And so we're just left with our aerodynamic like side force there. So that means y star is equal to zero. We have no force coming from the side on the aircraft to make this landing, which makes sense. But it's cool that this result just came mathematically out of substituting our reference uh, flight values into our dynamics. It just, it happened to roll out that way. Okay, so then this one's gonna be this. Equals zero. Okay. So I want to make I want to make a point here. This gives us a couple relationships as you can see, but um I want to show this first one, but I want to expand it out just a little bit. So I'm going to isolate this thrust term. And remember, 
we have some control inputs. So our input vector, there, there's four elements of our input vector, like dt, etc. And the forces that appear here are functions of those. So the thrust is going to be a function of my thrust, my throttle setting, input, whatever that is, and maybe some other things. And we'll get into more detail in this in coming classes, but I just want to make this point here. So the thrust is going to be equal to that weight term minus this x aerodynamic force. And this aerodynamic force, that's going to be a function of like my elevator angle, my ailerons, my rudder, probably not so much the rudder, but, and some other things. Um, and, and let's also do this with, with this equation. I'll just say Z stars, like a function of a couple of these things. <clears throat> so if I take these two equations from so from these relationships we can solve for our equilibrium control variables but you're going to notice here that there's like four unknowns and I only have two equations here so there's not going to be a unique solution. There's many possible solutions. For example, um, this thrust force, I could use, let's say I, I use less thrust. Well then, if, if this number becomes smaller, then this number has to become smaller. And that means that this like aerodynamic force needs to increase. So if I'm using less thrust, then to make up for it, I'm gonna need like some more aerodynamic force and maybe I have to increase my elevator angle and so on. Or if I'm using more thrust, then the aerodynamic force needs to go down. Maybe I decrease the elevator angle. So my point is these conditions here don't give us one answer. We actually need more conditions or you can just specify what's best for your application. Maybe you want to choose the option that uses less energy. So maybe I don't want to be producing a lot of thrust because that's using my engines and that's expending fuel. Maybe it's better for me to just change um, my elevator. So the point is, as long as the equations are satisfied, we're still going to stay on the reference flight path. So as long as I pick something that still satisfies these equations overall, then we're okay. Okay, the last thing we're going to do today, I'm going to take these, these conditions here, but it's also a popular choice to express these conditions in the wind frame. Right now, these are in terms of body frame aerodynamic forces. So we'll just go through transforming this to the wind frame and then we'll, we'll close out the day. You can go into your weekend. So thank you guys for hanging with me this Friday. Okay, so we could express this in the wind frame. And why do we want to do that? Well, often we want to, you have the angle of attack variable show up and that's in the wind frame um, so this is the rotation matrix from the body frame to the wind frame 
I think it was two lectures back we, we talked about the wind frame. Um, from our reference flight condition, we don't have any side slip for this, this problem. So if we make that substitution where beta is zero, this matrix is going to become a lot simpler. It's going to be zero. This is going to be one. This is going to be zero. This is zero. Okay. So this is the rotation matrix at our reference flight condition. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply this rotation matrix by um, this vector right here. But I'm going to separate this vector into two vectors. So in one vector, I want to grab all the aerodynamic forces, so x, y, and z. And then the other vector, I'm going to get like the weight and the thrust force. So you'll see that here. So I'm going to take the rotation matrix times my aerodynamic forces. So I just pulled those out. And then what's left over, I still have to multiply that by the rotation matrix. So it's the weight and the thrust. This term is 0. And this term is the weight cosine of that pitch angle. All right, if we multiply this out, there we go. We can kind of get this in the same frame. Oh, but it's so small. I'll just write it out. All right, we're going to have cosine of this angle of attack times this weight plus the thrust. Just check, I'm just double checking this right here. <coughs> Plus. Minus. Oh, right, 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 right. That's what I'm missing here. So this, this term right here, if you multiply that rotation matrix by x, y, z, we defined this by definition. So that's what this equal sign with the triangle on top is. By definition, that's going to be in the wind frame minus drag, positive side force, and minus lift. And we'll put those equilibrium things. So that's that's in the wind frame. So at the end of each of here, I'm going to put minus. I'm just going to add those in right away. Minus lift. So that's that's this piece. And then I got to add. I got to add this piece. So this is going to be weight, sine alpha, cosine theta star. This is 0 over here. Minus sine alpha, minus w sine theta, plus the thrust, weight. Okay, so all we did here, we took our translational dynamics equation, which is in the body frame, and we simplified it 
And then we said, heck, let's write this in the wind frame as well. Because I want you to see what this looks like in the wind frame, because that's, that's often how it's done in textbooks, actually. So, so this is what it is. And if you simplify this a little bit, so this is just rearranging those terms up there, we get this. And this is just giving us an alternative relationship that we can use to solve for the equilibrium variables. Um, so, for example, the drag is a function of my control variables. It's also a function of the angle of attack, side slip, like all of this stuff. So we're going to have these equations to solve for these equilibrium conditions. And that's basically what I wanted to show you today. I know it kind of gets in the weeds of the math here. But it's also, when you're doing it yourself for a couple, for different problems, it's, it's kind of a fun puzzle too. At least I think so. All right, so that's it for today. We're gonna get back into reference flight conditions next week. We're gonna do some more concrete examples. We'll get some numbers thrown in there. Um, so we get to the bottom of some of these things. But I hope you get the basic idea from what we did today. And with that, have a fantastic weekend. Hey, enjoy your weekend, Billy. Appreciate it.